Some people are writing papers now or will be soon. Some people have submitted papers and we're waiting for decisions. And the group's next paper will be my hundredth paper. So the next one to get accepted will be the hundredth paper to be accepted. And I figured that this was a good time to sort of reflect on what I've learned about um, publishing over the last uh, 17 years since I published my first uh, paper in Organic Letters. So this talk is going to focus idiosyncratically on journals related to materials chemistry, organic chemistry, nanotechnology, and biomaterials. So in other words, uh, stuff that we do in the lab and places that I have experience publishing. Um, so there's a lot of other you know, types of publications that maybe uh, your colleagues in other fields publish in, but you know, that's not, not my experience. So I uh, published my first paper 17 years ago, and um, that was the total synthesis of basiliskamides A and B uh, in organic letters, and uh, that was as an undergrad at BU. And then in the intervening time, uh, the process of publishing has gotten more annoying and less exciting uh, to me now uh, <laughs> than it was then. Um, I think in general, uh, what we're doing with the mechanical properties of organic semiconductors is still uh, very well received. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that the standards for rigor have really improved increased in that field largely due to uh, to our efforts. So uh, we have a lot to be uh, proud of uh, for that and I think our lab is sort of regarded you know as, as one of the first or maybe the first lab to spend a lot of time thinking about uh, mechanical properties of organic semiconductors and really using chemistry as a tool to understand them you know rather than just uh, sort of all off the shelf stuff. So that's a good place to be. We should absolutely be proud of it. And in general, those papers that are sort of on physical organic chemistry of uh, conjugated polymers and mechanical properties, those papers are still getting accepted um, and, uh, and no, no, you know, no problem there. Um, but, uh, however, we're doing a lot of stuff now that has never been done before uh, in terms of combining material science and materials chemistry with haptic interfaces, doing human subject trials on haptic materials that we synthesize in the lab, and there's really no natural home for this stuff, and, you know, I guess it could be you know, look how special we are, how uh, interdisciplinary we are, but that's really where the knowledge is to be created, in my opinion, is the space between fields. So as a result, our overall rejection rate has gotten a lot higher in the last couple of years. Um, but, uh, and, and I'm, I'm becoming more, <laughs> more and more annoyed at the type of reception that our, uh, our work is, uh, is getting. Um, so I'm getting, uh, I'm, 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 getting kind of more annoyed about like finicky reviewers who like take 20 minutes to read our paper and produce a referee report that's like five sentences long um, and apparently the editor takes it as uh, as a legitimate vote in as to the quality of our paper uh, versus one our own expertise and two the expertise of the other reviewers who clearly put a lot of uh, thought and scholarship into the report to provide an honest critique um, and those reviews apparently getting equal weight by the editor of course they'll say that they that they don't provide you know give equal weight to all the reviews but you know um, I, uh, I take take that for what it is um, so I wish that editors would pay more attention to the quality of reviews received and maybe like you know grade the reviewers on the quality of review rather than just dumping them on the authors and like I'm established in my career and I can handle it like I might lose some sleep here and there uh, with a with a by reading a mean review but um, but but all of but it's all of you and students in other labs who pay the emotional price for the thoughtlessness and bruising criticisms of a like a careless review, especially if the review is off the mark, which, um, you know, despite the sanctity of peer review and all that, 
you know, all that B-U-L-L-S-H-I-T uh, that uh, science, you know, holds itself to this peer review standard. A lot of times the reviews are off the mark and we've all experienced it. You know, people joke about reviewer three on Twitter um, or reviewer two or whatever reviewer it is with, you know, countless memes and stuff. But reviewer three is not only annoying, but I think they do real harm. Um, you know, as a result, when I write a referee report, I really try to focus on what would make the claims of the paper stronger. Um, if there's nothing, then I just say accept as is, or or if there's nothing that wouldn't be, you know, above a uh, that that if 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 it's already at the level of you know above the median for papers in the field, then just say I just say accept as is because I don't want to waste the author's time by turning their paper into my pet project. So I've heard from older scientists, like really old, a lot older scientists, that there was a, a system of publication in place where the editor actually did a lot more of the work themselves. And the editor behaved like a, like a normal editor in journalism or magazine journalism, like newspaper journalism, um, and read the paper carefully and took a lot of the decision on to themselves as to the, uh, as to the, the fit with the scope and the scientific rigor. And now it really seems seems to me that editors are so busy and they're busy people, I, I get it, but they, it seems that they play uh, referee bingo. So the uh, this is a phrase that my friend Ryan Shecky at University of Groningen, uh, Groningen said that um, that they basically look at all one to one to as many as five referee reports and they basically just say okay accept 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 reject accept okay that's a reject so it's like like bingo you're trying to get trying to get you know three or four or five in a row uh and it really does seem especially for like the prestige journals that you need unanimous accept decisions in order for the editor to uh to to say accept and i i don't think it should be that way um, also, as an aside, why do we have a variable number of reviewers? Sometimes it's five reviewers, sometimes it's one. <laughs> I've had five and I've had one and, and everywhere in between. And I think the answer is because, you know, the editor sends the paper out to five reviewers sometimes. Some number of them are going to say no and then some will say yes, but sometimes they all say yes. Then you end up with five reviewers. Sometimes, you know, the median is probably two or two and a half or something. And, but then you're doing 150% more work if your paper is unlucky enough to get five reviewers <laughs> during, the, uh, during the review process. So it seems like some standardization is in order. A couple times I've had one reviewer where the paper was so late in getting reviewed and I complained to the editor and then the editor just went with one reviewer and said, yeah, based on my assessment, you know, this is this is fine. But that's one reviewer. <laughs> so um, also, I am finding that uh, I'm, I'm sort of at a point, you know, almost nine years through my independent career that I'm having an impact in parts of my professional career that does, do not involve traditional publishing. Um, aspects of my uh, career like teaching where I you know, get generally positive feedback and outreach like uh, the YouTube channel and the podcast where I get like only positive feedback. And then frankly, it really sucks to have somebody read your paper for 20 minutes, write five sentences, and <laughs> give you a bunch of off the mark criticism. And then you have to go through the process of like submitting it somewhere else. But you know, that's, that's the game, right? That's, that's what, what we do. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm under no illusions that like my role and like identity as a researcher and any success I've had as a researcher made possible these other things like uh, outreach, te teaching, and, uh, and so forth. Okay, all of that complaining aside, um, all of that complaining aside, you and I absolutely must care about publishing uh, high quality research and getting it uh, and getting it out into the world. So as my old advisor uh, said, um, if we're doing stuff that does not lead to papers or another form of like dissemination, then there's really no point in doing it. 
Um, so also publishing a paper as opposed to a patent is a pretty sure way for basic science to get out into the real world. There's some debate about this because um, in the business world, you would say, well, you need a patent to give uh, some protection to the people that are going to operate or that are going to execute on your, uh, um, on your invention. Otherwise, there's no incentive for them to do it. But that is only for a few key types of patents. Most of the time, it's the R&D departments at companies and startups that are looking up the academic literature to like figure out how to run this process. And, um, and that is it's sort of an invisible way that, uh, that the work we do makes a difference, but it is incredibly important. So for example, look at the transformative impact of mRNA vaccines. So mRNA vaccines are what is gonna get um, the, to get the US back on its feet after a, a year of hell. Um, and for example, my wife's paper from grad school was one of the patents, um, or one of the papers cited in, the, in Moderna's key patent. So granted, there were a lot of papers cited, but the point is that true transformation rests on a pyramid of discoveries in basic science, and the impact is really hard to predict. Um, and it's kind of a, a religious leap of faith that we have to take that the work we're we're doing will matter. And the mechanism for now that that gets out into the world is through the academic literature. Also, for those of you going on into academics or grad school, grad, grad school, or I'm looking at it, so I dictated this, right? And a postdoc always appears as post stock, as in chicken stock. So anyway, grad if you go on to academics or grad school, not stool, or post-doc, uh, publication is the key metric by which your productivity uh, is judged. Um, but I'm going to make the case that where you publish is a lot less important than you probably think it is. So... <laughs> We are predominantly talking about a relatively small number of journals in the ACS, RSC, and Wiley portfolios. So ACS, American Chemical Society, RSC is Royal Society of Chemistry, which is sort of like um, the UK's ACS. So there are some relevant journals uh, like science, the Science and Nature portfolios and a few in uh, uh, Elsevier, but they're somewhat less relevant in part because it's so freaking hard to get a paper into Science and Nature um, or Nature Blank, and then the Elsevier uh, portfolio tends to be, uh, with the exception of the new like cell press stuff, uh, a lot of them tend to be really, really, really specialized. Um, and they're a little bit, uh, they're not really our, our, our mode place of, of publication. So primarily ACS, RSC, and Wiley is what we're talking about. So what do I mean like prestige? So that often takes the form of impact factor. So the impact factor of a journal is the, uh, is the average number of, I'm going to get maybe the subtlety wrong, but it's like the average number of papers that a, um, or citations that a paper gets in its first two years of citation, of, of publication. Um, and it might be a few years out, it might be like the taken the third and second year out. Um, but anyway, people uh, can um, find that out for themselves. But anyway, the impact factor um, of the journal is less important than a lot of other factors. So a good place to start um, in asking where you should publish is why are you publishing it? So maybe you need to show a grant reviewer that your data have been peer reviewed and that you actually have the capability to do something even if it wasn't part of your formal training or degree title. For example, it was really important for us to publish uh, Colin Keefe's paper on the haptic glove for virtual reality. And the reason it was really important to publish that, no matter where it went, it ended up in advanced intelligence systems. It was really important to publish that uh, regardless of impact factor because uh, we needed to be able to write that in a grant. Because previously they said that this group does like some chemistry and mechanical testing, but they don't, they can't make integrated like haptic systems in VR. But if you have the paper, that's peer reviewed, boom, you can cite it and then the, the, you remove that entire criticism from the, uh, from the repertoire, <laughs> from the quiver of the person who you know, is reading 10 grants and can only fund one. Another reason 
is that maybe you need to have a publication on an invention in order to show a licensee of a patent that there was intellectual weight behind the invention. Or say you're involved in a company and your investors uh, or your, um, your strategic partners need to see that your, that your, that your shit actually works. Uh, and the way to do that is to show peer-reviewed publication, or one way to support that is peer-reviewed publication. Another reason why it matters not so much where the paper is published um, is because you can always get your work out in two ways. One of which is by speaking about it at conferences or even like tweeting it or putting it on YouTube. Um, but even just an MRS conference where you might have 100 people in the room or an ACS conference might have a much higher impact than a paper published in a low circulation journal, even if that's where the paper is published. Because, hey, I'm talking about it. People can, you know, are learning about it and they can cite it, even if the actual source material was in a, uh, you know, quote, lower impact journal. Um, Oftentimes, uh, you'll publish a result in a lower impact journal, and then you or your PI, or you or me, will get an invitation to write a mini review or progress report in a, uh, you know, quote, higher impact journal. And you can legally adapt these figures with permission, you know, copyright permissions that you obtain from the original copyright holder, and then you can get your work out that way. So. If it's published in Sensors and Actuators Q, but then you get an invitation to write a perspective on your own work in Advanced Materials, hey, now that result is in Advanced Materials. Um, so, and, and the the advantage of doing this is that like uh, these invited kind of fluff pieces, like the pieces that aren't original research, um, are much less likely to get rejected by the journal. And um, I have to admit that this has kind of become our relationship with a certain uh, family of, uh, of journals in the Wiley portfolio. And I use the word fluff as a, a pejorative only when describing it to use the determination of impact factor. Um, I actually think there's a lot of value in uh, pieces like editorials, reviews, um, and essays, and kind of that kind of like aggregator type of content. Um, but I do feel strongly that these pieces should not count toward the impact factor of the journal. It's just not fair because they get cited a lot, and you know you're comparing apples and oranges. One journal that publishes this type of content and one journal that doesn't. For example, um, you know, there's a reason why the impact factor of chemical reviews is higher than the impact factor of science or nature, uh, pretty, you know, pretty significantly. So there are some journals like Nanolet, uh, Nanoletters, which have achieved their impact factors without this kind of like uh, aggregator material. Um, there are others which are regarded as perhaps just as prestigious, but whose impact factors are substantially inflated um, because they put a lot of effort into special issues, editorials, essays, progress reports, and so on. And you get sort of the picture. Also, impact factor is, uh, is kind of a misleading metric because there are journals that are regarded as the most scholarly journals in their field, which do not have a high impact factor. Good examples in polymer science are macromolecules, which might be the premier journal in polymer science in the world, um, and it has an impact factor of around five. Same thing with soft matter. So soft matter physics is a uh, you know, it has a, a very respectable intellectual uh, history and a lot of depth, but the flagship journal, Soft Matter, has an impact factor that's even lower. Lower than five, that is. So like all content in the ACS portfolio and most of the content in the RSC portfolio, these journals are edited by peer editors, that is people who made their names uh, for themselves as scholars in the field of uh, polymer science or soft matter, but this uh, kind of hard scholarly work, um, uh, frankly, just doesn't get that much attention, especially internationally. Um, in contrast, the next fancy wearable gadget that's really hard to do in the clean room but doesn't involve much in the way of scholarship, uh, those things get a ton of citations. Um, so there is a, and, and I should say, you know, that type of work is really, really hard to do. Like, we're just going to make a, uh, you know, 
wearable, whatever, but we're not going to use a very high N. We're not going to do statistics. We're not going to do like extensive data workup. It's just a really amazingly, you know, produced device that generates awesome pictures. Um, yeah, that stuff gets more citation uh, on average than uh, papers that might focus on materials and mechanics issues, for example, in the same type of device. Um, there is a very popular for-profit journal in our field that exemplifies the strategy of publishing lots of aggregator papers, which get cited a lot, combined with special issues and uh, get guest edited by famous people. And they also put a lot of resources like money into search engine optimization to make sure that their uh, titles are the ones that get, uh, that get flagged when people Google search them. All right, so um, that said again, I don't want to look like a hypocrite because my most cited paper is my carbon nanotube paper from my postdoc in Nature Nanotechnology, a good for-profit journal uh, that surely looked good on my faculty application, but that was far from my mode publishing experience even up to that point. Even now, um, my top three most cited papers are all from my postdoc. Actually, my top five most cited papers are all from my postdoc. The top three are in uh, are in these for-profit journals. The first in Nature Nanotech, second is in Advanced Functional Materials, and the third is in Advanced Materials. Um, but in the top five are also a number four is in Chemistry of Materials, and number five is Energy and Environmental Science. So at least ACS and RSE got in there uh, into the top five. So okay, I, I do look like a hypocrite. Top three papers published there, but since becoming a professor, we have published one original research paper in the advanced blank family. And almost all the rest of our scholarly output has been in ACS and RSC journals published by, by peer, by scholarly peer editors. Um, and the proof is kind of in the pudding. Um, I got promoted to tenure in four years and to full professor in seven years with only in material science with only one paper in original research paper in the advanced uh, portfolio. So that's uh, I I'm quite uh, quite proud of that actually. So there's a lot of talk in the group now. Um, if you think that I'm talking about you, I may be talking about you, but I'm also talking about five other people who may have been asking, uh, is this journal good enough for me? Um, that is, you know, it sure seems like there are higher impact factor journals out there, and why not just go for the highest one? And let me give you an example of why I think this, uh, this really isn't an argument. Um, the, <laughs> and, and, that uh, that if you look at our, our mode journals, um, they are almost all in uh, nonprofit society journals like Chemistry of Materials, uh, Applied Materials and Interfaces, Nano Letters, ACS Nano, and Nanoscale. These are all society journals. So uh, the and and the irony of the you know the impact factor for these like prestige journals. It, the high impact for journals is that they have really bad response times. I don't have data for this, but this is true pretty much every time. Um, the, the response times are glacial. So time to first decision, time to get the reviews back, time to get a response to the reviews, time to get the proofs back, time for them to accept the proofs, and then time to get page numbers. You'll have a digital object identifier for sometimes six months before you finally get page numbers to put on your CV. And the irony, uh, the second irony is that these journals have a professional editorial staff who don't have uh, jobs running research groups and teaching. The only thing they do is edit the journals. Um, and uh, they they are, are all fine people, but they tend to be very junior. They tend to be very junior people who are PhD scientists, but in general, when right from their, uh, their training uh, in the scientific, uh, their scientific training to the publishing world without really practicing independent scholarship. Um, there's also something about all academic publishing that really rubs me the wrong way. And this, um, 
uh, this criticism criticism applies for 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 profit and society journals. Although it seems especially egregious in the for profit space, and that is this: journals get free content, free che fact checking services, and even outsource a lot of the editorial role to the reviewers. That is, does this content fit with the editorial scope of the journal? Then they take all this taxpayer subsidized work and then charge taxpayer funded institutions and researchers to get access to it. So in my opinion, this is a racket. Um, however, it does appear that the community is taking steps to fix it with preprint services and various open access uh, options and so forth, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, now. Uh, let's talk about the let's talk about the equity that universities are getting in paying this grant money um, to the publication houses to sort of steward all of this research. So the question is, you know, do universities get equity for the amount of money that they pay for journal subscriptions? You know, there's definitely some value in standardization of typesetting, getting your paper published, organizing the peer review process such as it is getting the paper published in a professional looking format, you know, it certainly looks satisfying when you finally get the proofs. Um, but a lot like a university diploma with the name of a fancy school written on it, you know, having a paper published in science gives it an air of credibility. Although it does seem like sometimes high profile papers seem to be the ones that get retracted later, although I may be subject to availability bias here. Um, I think the movement that, that, uh, that uh, subscription-based journals have toward open access options is kind of an annoying trend. So basically the taxpayers pay pay for the research, research and then the researcher pays for the honor of publishing it in a journal. Um, it seems like an extra step that we don't need, to be honest. Um, just because the, the journals are doing it now it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Um, it really seems like it's an attempt for them to stay relevant and a lot of publishing houses are doubling and tripling down on the idea um, uh, you know, for example, the, uh, the, the ACS gold line of journals that you have to pay to, to publish in. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a noble intent and it's, I guess it's, you know, good to have more options of where to publish in, but I, I don't know if this, I'm comfortable with this trend. Um, so these like, f these pay to play, um, you know, open access journals uh, sounds like a strategy to siphon tax dollars into the uh, pockets of the publishing houses and also the amounts of money we're talking are outrageous, especially compared to, to what you get. Um, like to publish in Nature Communications is over $5,000. So you could pay the $5,000 article processing fee or you could support a, a college student um, to work in a lab for a summer and change their life forever, um, or you could fork over that same amount of money to uh, to Nature Publishing Group. Um, people make fun of PLOS One, and I don't think they should. I really think the founders of PLOS One had the right idea. Um, it has a, a huge pool of volunteer editors and give the job um, uh, and give the give the job of the reviewers to publish good science, and if it passes like scientific muster, don't give any attention to editorial scope or perceived impact. I think that's a that's a really good uh, good model. Plus, one is still relatively cheap to publish in. It's like uh, like fifteen hundred, a little north of fifteen hundred. It's definitely not you know five thousand like Nature Com is. Um, and the editorial scope is actually quite honorable, like publish the good, the good data, have a comment section associated with each paper so people can read the comments in real time. Um, the U.S. government has stepped in fairly recently to ensure that most federally funded papers end up available for free, at least ultimately. So thankfully, if your work is published and supported by NIH and NSF, then by law, your paper has to be made publicly available on the government server 12 months after publication. So that's a step in the right direction. Of course, it's not copy edited and all that stuff, but, you know, honestly, who cares? So, um, 
I absolutely believe that these things must be changed. Um, it seems like the preprint servers are doing a good job. Uh, most of the preliminary data about the COVID-19 pandemic that led to press release was done on the basis of preprints. So I'm sure you've all seen this in like the New York Times, like this study has not been peer reviewed, uh, but it's in a you know bio archive or, or wherever it is. And then, you know, a couple months later it gets peer reviewed and, you know, usually it's fine. Um, so maybe one idea is to have peer review done in real time Time, you know, by by uh, by experts like, and then upvote the most common criticisms, addenda, and so forth, and then maybe that would be the only way to to do away, It'll sort of sort of run scientific publishing like Reddit, kind of, and then do away with the entire entire journal publishing system. But you know, who knows? Um, maybe not. <laughs> Um, so some of you in closing may wish to explore this further if you continue in academia. Um, for me, while many aspects of the current system annoy me, um, it's probably best that uh, I leave this to others so I can focus on my primary job, which is to get you the next job that you want and to help you flourish the maximum extent possible while you're here. And for now, that involves working with the system that we have, however imperfect. So thank you for listening to my rant, and I'm happy to open the floor for discussion. Should you accept invitations to guest edit books and special collections? I have been a guest editor of MRS Bulletin one time, and I felt that that was a good experience. Like MRS Bulletin is, so being a guest editor involves getting uh, a bunch of like PI colleagues and inviting them to submit articles to a special issue. And the MRS Bulletin was tied to a particular symposium that I organized and it felt like a good way to have like a, you know, a hard, like a, like a hard copy uh, for posterity, you know, to have with that, uh, associated with that symposium. Uh, I have turned down every single offer since then um, to do, be the guest editor of a journal or a book because um, it's banging your head against the wall trying to get PIs to submit their stuff on time, and the guest editor rarely gets any equity for that level of service commitment. The key thing in accepting any of these, uh, these while they may seem like uh, like flattering offers is what else can you be doing with that time and what's the opportunity cost and in all calculations I've done since then like mental calculations it's always seemed like more trouble than it was worth um, the second question how do I decide which uh, and oh and and also the guest editor thing is like you know, who's that serving? If you think it's really serving the community, then by all means do it. That's why I did the MRS bulletin that one time. Um, but if it's serving the publisher, then no. <laughs> like, you know, if, if they want you to do the work, you know, if they want you to do the work for free for them, no. Because it's not service, it's not serving the the PIs that you invite because they'll be able to submit that work somewhere else. You know, they're not going to come up with a piece of research whole cloth just to submit it to this one special issue. You know, they'll submit it wherever they were planning on submitting it anyway. Um, the other question about how do I decide which reviews to accept, which referee invitations to accept, um, entirely for papers that I want to read. That's it. Um, they're, they're papers th that, that I want to read and that I think I can say something intelligent about. Um, I get, because we've published in a lot of areas, I get a huge number of very disparate invitations and they, uh, I, I turn down all the ones that are like, you know, have the, the, so because we work in stretchable electronics, there are a bunch of like papers that I get about, you know, some kind of nanoparticle embedded in PDMS or perfluoropolyether or like polyurethane as a new stretchable conductor. Those are all, that's a really boring topic to me. Um, not, not interested <laughs> unless I think there's some like real scholarship in there. I'm not, I'm not going to, to say yes 
to uh, to accepting it or I'm sorry to accepting the invitation to review it if it's something that is about you know mechanical properties of organic semiconductors if it's about a material centric approach to haptics um, if it's about uh, you know, graphene based strain sensors then then yes and also if I think that one of you will get something uh, useful out of uh, reading it then I'll ask the editor for permission to share it with uh, with one of you um, and they always say yes are you more likely to accept an invitation to review if you know the editor yeah I think that's human nature so if you if you know an editor and they but but also, if you know an editor, they're a lot more likely to send you something that you can actually review. <laughs> you know, if it's somebody that you don't know and they're just guessing what you do based on some quick, you know, Google search, then chances are they're gonna they're not gonna get it right. But if the editor knows you. Uh, then they know what interests you scientifically, you know, you're, you're less likely to turn it down. Is there ever a competition between writing a paper and writing a patent? Writing a patent is not as simple as just um, taking your manuscript and filing it as a provisional patent. Um, in order to file a strong provisional patent, you need to have that is one that's actually useful that you can use to market your product to a potential licensee that actually takes the expertise of a patent lawyer to go through and make it a strong patent because ip is like an investment um, if it can't be protected or if it can't be marketed then it's useless so it needs to be a strong provisional patent and the provisional patent is what you file while the patent application is under review usually you submit the provisional patent and then you have uh, 12 months to submit the official patent application so the provisional patent takes money to get into a shape where it's actually worth something then the patent application takes a ton of money to get it to the point where it's worth something the patent application fees are or the fee is you know relatively low but the amount of money that it takes to uh, to pay a patent attorney to write it properly so that it's actually you know worth something and can't be engineered around easily is on the order of 50k and where are we going to get the 50k so in order to get the 50k you either have to have to raise the money from a uh, from a uh, like an, an investor um, you have to have the cash to pay it you have to uh, you have to win it in a competition like like Alex Zaretsky did um, you uh, and or you have the licensee the potential licensee pay it so you take the provisional patent and you give it to you know uh, whatever company you want to license it to and they uh, you know they say I'm gonna support your patent application and they'll give you the money but in return they're gonna want some kind of licensing deal for it and that's that makes total sense there are some like rich universities that uh, pay all the patent costs and then have a substantial equity stake in the company that uh, that is that ultimately arises from from that that might be part of the deal like say uh, I'm not exactly sure what the details were but when Larry and Sergey started Google um, since Stanford you know supported the patent costs uh, Stanford ended up with a big equity position in Google and when Google IPO would Stanford made over 300 million dollars um, UCSD does not have and most universities don't have like a patent slush fund that they can just you know hand out 50k if they don't have a potential licensee so writing a patent isn't just as simple as writing a patent um, as, as like writing a paper you don't just write a patent the patent has to have teeth it has to be defendable it has to be marketable and it has to clearly show why it is uh, why it's novel useful and not obvious in one of three areas which are um, which are uh, process device and composition of matter so yeah good question that's something that comes up a lot